So today's lesson is going to be on atomic structure, again focusing on emission spectra and how that helps us figure out Bohr's model of the atom, or how Bohr actually figured out the model of the atom analyzing emission spectra. So what is an emission line spectra? Well, gases under reduced pressure in a tube with high voltage produce line spectra with specific wavelengths. So if you had a gas tube and you lit it up and by putting a high voltage, you would actually see light being created. And that's actually what happens up in the fluorescent light bulbs above me. And, and so when we analyze those, you actually get these bright line spectra. What does that look like? Well, first of all, it was discovered by Niels Bohr. And when we look at it, here is what would look like if you had uh, light that came from the sun. Sun typically has what is called continuous spectra. And the continuous spectra just means it has all the lights of the, um, of the rainbow, all the colors of the rainbow. And that's why whenever you see rainbows out there, they have all these colors because what the, rain, what the rain is doing, it's splitting up the light into all its component colors that are in there. And that's how we see it. Well, if you do a gas tube, you would see what is called an emission spectra, where you only have specific lights, different colors on there, green, blue, and more. That's more indigo, and this is the, this is the bluish violet. And so this would be the emission spectra. Uh, of something that comes from, you know, one of the elements, say, for instance, I think this is helium, or this might be mercury, I'm not sure. But this would come from a specific element, and each element has its own, actually, atomic um, emission spectra signal. And if we were to shine light into the tube, um, what it would do is it would absorb specific colors. And so whenever we ask the question, you know, what color is something, like this red thing right here, what this is doing, it's absorbing all colors except for the colors of red that you see here. And so what it's doing is it reflects the rest of those colors that we see in terms of red. And so that's how an absorption spectra actually works out. It absorbs all the colors and, and basically uh, uh, shows that. And so here's an example of what that would look like. And so when you put the, put the light through, so here's the a, here's a light bulb right here. As the light goes through the slit, a prism can separate into separate colors. And so this is an example of hydrogen right here, where it has four different colors from the hydrogen. Here's an example of helium right here. Here's an example of barium. And of course, here's an example of white light. And so with all these different um, bright line spectres, you can see that you get different lines. And the big question, of course, that came up is, why only specific bright lines? Why not the entire spectrum for the atom or an element? And that's basically where we get Bohr's model come from. So again, here's another picture of that where you have the separation due to a, a refraction in the, in the lens here, the prism. Of course, if you're in physics, you would learn about refraction in there. And of course, the emission spectra of hydrogen, you can actually measure the wavelength of each color. So here we have something that's in the almost 650, 660 range. This one's more like 490 or 480. This is more like 440, 430, and of course 410 roughly over here. And of course, based on the wavelength, we learned that you can figure out the frequency of each of these. And if you know the frequency, you can find the energy. Um, and so that's basically the analysis. So then what Bohr was able to do was then analyze all these energies. And from that, he gave a, an idea for what the structure looks like. So, as I said earlier, of course, each of them have their own fingerprints. And from this, um, we're going to be doing this lab where we can actually test these flame colors and see what colors are actually in there by actually analyzing the flame colors themselves. And it turns out, again, each element has its own specific color. Sodium is known typically for its yellowish-orange color. Potassium, more of this uh, purplish-white color. Lithium, more on the red. Barium, of course, here, the yellowish, it's supposed to be a little greenish there, but it's missing in that color. And so Bohr came up with an idea for the atom. And his idea was this. He said that electrons can only have specific quantized energy levels. So they're only allowed in very specific energy levels. So if I put a dot for the nucleus here, right there, um, right there, um, I don't know why my dot's not working. OK, there we go. So there's my nucleus. Here's the first energy level. Here's the second energy level. Here's the third energy level. 
And the idea is that as electrons go around the atom, so now they're going round and round around the atom, they're only allowed at very specific quantized energy levels. They can't be in between here. They're only allowed wherever these orbits are, are located. And the idea is that whenever an electron, say up here, comes down to a lower energy level, then a photon is released in the process. And this is where you get that frequency of color that comes out. And of course, you have that specific wavelength. And so from this is where we get the color of light. If I were then to then transition from here to the first energy level, then you would get a different color, and you'd get a different photon coming out of there. And, and that, of course, would be a different color. And each transition from three, 2 to 1 or from 3 to 2 gives off a different color. And that's where we kind of got an idea that maybe because of the colors we saw in those bright line spectra or emission spectra, that's where we realized that maybe electrons were only allowed in those energy levels. And the second thing he talked about was that light is emitted as those electrons move from one energy level to a lower energy level. So it has to come from a high energy level to go down to a low energy level for the photons to be released. The bigger the jump, the more energy, and the more, of course, you lead towards the the right side of the electromagnetic spectrum. So remember we talked about the colors Roy G. Bibb. As you move from R to violet, this is where you have the sh shorter wavelengths or higher energy because it's a higher frequency. And in the red side you have the longer wavelengths. And so as you move in this direction, you get more energy. And so the bigger the transition, this would be more of a purple color, a violet. And of course, this transition over here is so small, it might be red or infrared, because infrared, of course, is on the left side of red, and ultraviolet would be over here. And the bigger the jump, you'd go more into the ultraviolets, and to the point where you can actually get x-rays out of these guys. Not very easy to get, but you can. And so we have two possibilities. Um, Either the electron receives a very specific energy to transition to a higher energy level, so it's called absorption, or the electron will come back down to a lower energy level, and that's when it releases a photon. We call that an emission. So absorption is when it transitions from low to high to absorb that photon's energy. Or an emission, of course, occurs when the photon is released as the electron transitions to a lower energy level. And just to give an analogy to the picture, here's a bunch of steps. The idea is if you do a lower jump, you know, the fact that we deal with Roy G. Bibb, this would be a low energy jump, and that's why it's a red color, right? That's why it's a red color. Whereas this jump over here um, is a bigger jump, and that's why we have the green color photon that comes out of this one. So the green photon comes out here, and of course it would be green in its color, whereas the red one over here would be a red photon, so it means it has to be a longer wavelength, something like this. And so you get that red that comes out from this transition. So that's how that works for these steps, at least at least with this analogy. And so energy can be calculated using h times frequency, and likewise energy can be calculated over here using h times frequency. The bigger, of course, the jump, the higher the energy, and you'd see that as well with the types of colors that's released. So when his electron goes down various energy levels, the amount of energy released, of course, is different. And so that's the key there. That's the key. And that's why we see those different bright line spectra. So to calculate all of this, Bohr came up with an equation with the help of Rydberg. And the equation, of course, relates to the energy level to a constant. So 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules all over n squared. So on the actual AP exam, what you wind up getting is just E sub n is equal to negative 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 all over n squared. That's all you get. However, you need to really translate that into this formula. And that formula says to find the, the change in the energy as it changes from one energy level to another, it's minus negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. And of course, we have the energy level that's where we're ending at energy level where we're starting at, and we use that to actually calculate the energy of transition in the atom, at least for the hydrogen atom. So this only works for the hydrogen atom. 
So in terms of a practice, why don't you pause right here and calculate. Here it says calculate the wavelength of a photon emitted by a hydrogen atom when its electron drops from the n equals 5 state to the n equals 3 state. So to solve this, we need the formula. So there's our formula right there. Oh, that's right. I don't like this formula. I like it. I like the version that I showed you just a second ago. And that formula, of course, looks like this. Delta E is equal to negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules, 1 over n final squared, minus 1 over n initial squared. That's actually a better formula. And the reason is because that negative. We want to talk about what happens there. So when we calculate this out, of course, uh, because their negative is not in there, this is actually reversed, and there should be a negative in the front. You get um, 1, since this is my initial state, and this is my final state. This, of course, is showing 1 over 25 as the initial showing up first, 1 over 9 for the final showing up first, because they distribute the negative sign. And you wind up getting a negative 1.55 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So what does this negative mean? The negative means that energy is released. So anytime it's negative, energy is released for a negative, which makes sense because if it's going from a high energy level to a low energy level, we expect the energy to be released. We expect a negative number. Now, of course, when using this in the second part of the problem, now I have to use my E equals H times nu to figure out the frequency. Actually, doing a little bit of algebra, I can then plug in E equals H times C all over nu, or over lambda, because frequency is equal to C over lambda. I can substitute that into this spot right here. Doing a little algebra, the wavelength then becomes HC all over E of the photon. And of course, I'm not going to plug in the negative number in this because the negative just tells me if it's released or absorbed. And so when I plug that in, there's no negative number. We get a number, and that, of course, is going to equal, uh, where's my answer? Oh, it's trying to cancel out units here. Sorry. That's no, all my, num my lines are not adding up. And you get a wavelength of equal to 1,280 nanometers. Now, of course, on your calculator, you're not going to get nanometers. You have to convert it by using the fact that one nanometer is equal to 10 to the minus 9. So if you have questions with that, come and see me during tutoring. So that's how we calculate that. And you want to make sure you understand how this all still relates to frequency and wavelength. So again, based on what we talked about, the energy released is going to be proportional to H times the frequency. And the electrons are only allowed to be in the specific orbits. The electron in its permitted orbit has a specific energy and is in allowed energy states. Um, the energy is only emitted or absorbed by an electron as it changes from one allowed energy state to another. And the energy, of course, corresponds to the photon, E equals H times nu. So if you have questions again about this, you know, again, there's that picture. You can see all of these are the transitions. Turns out for hydrogen, the 3 to 2 creates that red line. The 4 to 2 creates the blue-green line, and the 5 to 2 creates the violet. There's a 6 to 2 as well that creates another violet, and so that's where all the four colors come from. So Niels Bohr, as a summary, developed the quantum model of the hydrogen atom. He said the atoms were like a solar system. The electrons were attracted to the nucleus because of opposite charges. It didn't fall into the nucleus because it was moving around. When is it true? Well, this formula, again, only works for hydrogen atoms and other monoelectronic species. So it kind of works also with helium, which we mentioned in class, but you have to change the numerator on there to z squared. Why the negative sign? Because the negative means it's going to be released. Um, and the idea is that it also makes the energies work out. To increase the energy of the electron, you make it closer to the nucleus. And so you have a smaller negative number that way. And the maximum energy can have a zero, and that occurs at the infinite distance. So what are the limitations? Well, only applies to hydrogen, only crudely explains the spectra of the atoms. The electron is not merely a small object circling the nucleus. It does not travel in circles. And so we'll learn about that in the next unit, or in the next lesson. Electrons also exhibit wave properties. 
and we'll talk about what that means. These are things that, of course, the Bohr model does not address. And the quantization of energy is right, but not because they are circling like planets. So we'll talk about, again, based on a guy named Schrodinger's work, how this changes a little bit. So it says, notice Bohr's atomic model sucks. It really doesn't. It's a good approximation, let's say that. So that's it for now. Hopefully that makes sense. If you have any questions, come see me or email me.